And of course, to discuss this, we've got Harry K. Ngerim right here with us. You're welcome, Sir Harry. Thank you. All right. So um, quickly, let's look at the topic of discussion. Uh, what can you say about this, the Southern Kaduna crisis and the Middle Belt politics? That's me? Yes, sir. That's you. Okay. Well, well um, as, as, as has been indicated, I am in, uh, in the United States of America. So um, I hear what's going on. But I was born there. I lived there both in Kaduna and in Middle Belt. I am from the Middle Belt directly. So what I've been hearing is uh, does not look right. It's not right. And um, it clearly indicates um, a systematic way of, um, first of all, an indirect way to Islamize the country, okay? And the actual um, activity going on now is to basically to get rid of humans and let the cows roam around free and do what they need to do. That's my impression, that's what I see going on. And coincidentally, I continue to hear that those doing the killings are not Nigerians. That makes matters worse. And so it's of a great concern that basically the ruling, the administration right now is sowing the seeds that will, continue, that will now automatically transform Nigeria, the Middle Belt, into a really horrible battleground. Because what's going on right now? Those who have been killed will not forget what has been done. They will not forget what has been done. Um, and the administration right now looks like they don't have the ability or the capacity to do anything. And that's an issue of concern. That's an issue of concern. We have the military. We have all the armed forces in Nigeria, and yet this is going on for years. This is going on for years. And, and uh, unfortunately, since I'm not in Nigeria, I really don't know what the president is doing because I haven't heard anything from him. What I heard from him was something that's totally unacceptable because when it happened in Benue State, he told the indigents to learn how to live with their compatriots. If compatriots are going to butcher your mom and your dad, they're going to rape your sister, they're going to pluck the eyes of your five or seven year old brother. That doesn't tell me that you're compatriots. If they are compatriots, what would the enemies do? So I don't understand that. And it looks like continuously, continuously, it is going on even today. I had calls from home today that some of us out here are helping to take care of those who are in the IDP camps. The killers are living in the, in, in, in the, in the homes of those who are being killed. They are being starved. Their farms are being donated to the cows. What that means, I don't understand. I don't understand. Right now, it looks like, okay, the president is, um, I guess, a Fulani guy, so he can create ways for all the Fulani to do what the hell they want to do. The unfortunate thing is that he's not going to be present for life. When he gets off, he's going to take his cabal with him. 
the next president will not inherit that. If the next president is from some other area, what do we have? What do we have? So we'll have people now trying to revenge what happened. So we're going to translate Nigeria into an Israeli-Palestinian type war where children are going to wake up fighting each other not knowing what the hell they're fighting for. Because when my mother gets butchered, my sister gets raped, and you tell me that's a compatriot, and I should learn to live with him. What does that mean? This obviously did not start. Did not start today. It did not start 10 years ago. It started way back when Usman Danforio said Nigeria needed to be a donation to his father, Usman Danforio, Islamizing Nigeria. That's the, that's the root of all of these things here. Now, a U.S. general commanding the, of the, the forces in Africa is saying that you have Libyan people, you have Libyans, you have Somalians, you have Malians, Chadians that have been recruited to do all this job here, and they're heading for Nigeria. A U.S. general is reporting that. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? That's really my concern. Now, next, there, I understand the few people that were arrested and jailed a few months, two, three months, and released, they have, they have, they have repented for murdering people. And they have been rehabilitated and settled. I need to understand when foreigners get into Nigeria and they are apprehended, do they get resettled or do they get deported? If they are killing, should they, what should they face? No other country would accept what has been accepted in Nigeria. And obviously, the ruling Kabul knows that and their goal is to basically islamize the country the unfortunate thing is i don't know what else everybody else is doing yesterday is southern kaduna and the middle belt for whatever reason by whatever miracle when they get done with mid with middle belt where do you think they're heading? So, the southern part of Nigeria, the east, the west, they need to speak up. Because when Middle Belt is, is taken out, taken over by these animals, they're coming for you. That time, Bengal State is, I mean, Middle Belt is no more. So who's going to speak? If they head to the west first and get to the west, they'll head to the east and to the south. This is the time. This is the time for the entire country to stop and say no. When one region, when one state is under this kind of nonsense, then the entire country is under the same kind of nonsense. All right, we, uh, we thank you very much, uh, Henry, for this um, fine presentation we have made. A lot of people have joined us since you started speaking. I noticed that the Philip Hayab John is here now. Acknowledge the presence of Philip Hayab John in our midst. Our last discussion on Southern Kaduna, Philip was here with us. He gave a very nice. I can. The last time you were with us, we published a very uh, nice report about your 
article and what you said. Yeah. In fact, that report generated um, a lot of interest all over Nigeria because you went into history that many people are not aware of. Yes, and sir. we received a lot of questions, a lot of calls based on your presentation. Yes, sir. One of the most controversial statements you made <clears throat> is that some other ethnic groups in Nigeria arrived in southern Kaduna before the Fulani and Hausa people arrived. And yes. then you us instances to show that the Igbos and the Yorubas, even though you had contact with the Hausas in the 1750s, However, yes. that, that with regards to settlement, settling in southern Kaduna, that there are other ethnic regions that settled with you, with the indigenous of southern Kaduna before yes. the arrival of the houses. Are you yes. still insisting on that? Because we received the question on that. Are you willing to give further explanation on that point? Or are you saying, okay, sorry, I was wrong. I surrender. What do you have to say? No, I do not <laughs> surrender. I want to say that... Um, Historical evidence has shown that the evils actually were part of the establishment of the town that is called Southern, uh, that is called Kafanchan today. Uh, I have two, I have been able to have three evidences that the evils were here at least 1920s. For instance, I have the Igbo Grammar School in Kafanchan which was established by the Igbos. And I read from a district officer of the colonial government who wrote a book he called The Red Men of Africa. And he says that the teachers that were in Southern in, in Kafanchan at the time were all Igbos. Besides, there was another school that was established by the Igbo, Igbos. The school, unfortunately, is no longer standing today but I have been to the side of the school this evening. It's called Igbo Union Comprehensive High School. It was built in Kapanchan, unfortunately before the Civil War. I have always maintained that the Civil War would not have been possible had the people of Northern, particularly those of us who are ethnic minorities in Northern Nigeria, knew that we had much more in connection with the Igbos than we had with the people of the north. Because yes, we are northerners, we speak Hausa, we come from here, but the very fact that we are Christians has actually alienated us from northern Nigeria, that the north will look at us as an outsider. But I'm not looked at as, and as an outsider if I were to attend a church in, uh, in let's say, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in Imo State, if I'm to attend a church in Akwa Ibom State. If I'm to attend a church in, let's say, in State, once I wake, I raise my hand and say, I'm Philip Hayap John, I'm going to be accepted as a Christian. So the issue is that there was another identity apart from the northern identity, which we got, and that is our Christian identity. And this Christian identity is responsible for what today is called the middle bell. For the benefit of those of you who are arguing for the middle bell without actually knowing how it started, let me tell you that the Middle Belt, what is today the Middle Belt, came about in 1949, to be precise, when there was a motion in the Northern House of Assembly in Kaduna that all Christian missionary activities in Northern Nigeria should be stopped. And then there was a Dr. his name, I've forgotten his first name, but he, his name was Dr. E. Dr. E was a Catholic seminarian at that time. And then there was Rampam, Rampam was called Pastor Daniel Rampam in 1949. They started what they call Non-Muslim Northerners League. That is NLML, Non-Northerners Muslim League in 1949. And this Non-Northerners Muslim League was what, what was actually, be, what was, uh, what actually became what you call today as the Middle Belt. Because when they started the non-Northern Muslims League, it affected all the non-Muslims in, in Korende, Borno State, in Korende, Adama State, in Korende, Taraba State, in Korende, Kaduna State, in Korende, Plateau State. And they came together to say, we have a new identity. And this identity is the Christian identity, which the Northern Mohammedans at that time, the Northern Muslims, were trying to deny of us. 
So these people came together and formed the Non-Northern uh, non Muslim League in 1949. It was that which was said, okay, let's make it middle belt. And so it was because the, most of the key persons were from the plateau. So they started the, uh, what they call later on the middle belt. And then it went to the plateau and the Benue, which was also Benue plateau at that time for those of you who have actually read Nigerian history. So yeah, we have a very complex history in Northern Nigeria. And uh, this history shows that there has been a lot of these controversies in Northern Nigeria with regards to identity formation and identity formation as regards to religion. But my quest is that in the 21st century, we should not be talking about Muslim Christian, but we should be talking about something that binds us together, which is humanity. And that is my point, that humanity is greater than religious belief, is greater than any ethnic belief, we should think of ourselves as human beings and there be able to coordinate ourselves to work out a formidable and future Nigeria that we can be proud of. Um, all right. We thank you very much for this brief, brief presentation because our topic tonight yeah. is the Southern Kaduna crisis and middle belt politics. Now, everyone, yes. so, everyone conversant. So, do you, would you let me to say that the middle belt, when it began, it was called the Non-Northerners Muslim League. Then the Southern Kaduna, the people who are called Southern Kaduna, at that time they were never referred to as Southern Kaduna, but as Southern Zaria. So they joined the group. And in the year 1955, they hosted a meeting here in Kapanchan, yeah, which is actually like the center of Southern Kaduna. And then they brought in all the people of the Middle Belt from the Plateau, the Bainway, the, if you like, Niger, and uh, what is Kude Taraba, Gongola, which is uh, now Adamawa, and other parts of the world. And they came here to Kavanchan. From what I gathered in 1955, and inaugurated what the Southern Kaduna people were going to call at that time, the Nazit Union. And Nazit is a word that is in our language, which means my own people union. My own people's union. And they formed this union here in Kavanchan. So Kavanchan has, the, has contributed to the development of Southern, uh, of Middle Belt progress. And in 1959, what was called the independence elections, we actually stood on the platform of the Nazid Union, supported by the United Middle Belt uh, Congress at that time. And we won the House of Assembly in what was then the Northern House of Assembly. Right, now my question with regards to this brief history, you, you have given us this. Anyone conversant with the history of Nigeria will be familiar with names with names such as Joseph Taka, Godwin yes, Dabo, Joseph Taka, yes, Paul mm. Unongo, yes, the Middle Belt politicians. And then we know that at the at the time of independence, the Middle Belt politicians weren't exactly aligned with the Northern philosophy of government, even though they were all termed as one North, led by Amadou Bello then. So at yes. what point, and then we come down to 1979, for instance, we saw that yes. Kaduna State and the Kanu State voted separately to a different party, the PRP, yes. from that yes. voted for by the core North. In fact, yes. that was also the same thing that happened in the First Republic when they went to Nepu, rather than going to NPC, the Northern People's yes. Congress. So, but now, here we are today now, we now see Kanu and Kaduna State, Voting almost, uh, in fact, since 1999, since yes. 1999, Kanu and Kaduna State now vote identically the with the core north. Now, mm. my question is, what happened? Yes, you How did see, the first, yes, the first thing, uh, Elomba and all of us who are on this platform is that, unfortunately for those of us who were actually non-Muslims of northern Nigeria, who were called the pagan peoples, we didn't see the politics taking a religious point of view. I, I, I'm saying we because I am part of what it is today, but I wasn't born at that time. So our forefathers didn't see that the, the politics would take an, a, a religious point of view. So the Northern People's Congress, which we belong to in the 1950s and the 19, uh, 1960s, actually could not continue to cater for the needs and the aspirations of the non-Muslims of the north of Nigeria. So our people decided to actually align with what was then the Middle Belt Forum, but it was called United Middle Belt Congress in 1959. 
And we voted for this party because we felt we were ethnic groups. We all had languages other than Hausa. We all had cultures other than Hausa. And then we were non-Muslims in a large, to a large extent. So we aligned with these groups because first, we were looking at our cultural connection with them. And we're also looking at, because they all form the knock culture matrix. And then secondly, we, were, we had actually accepted Christianity at that time. And so there was a sort of connection. Now, why the politics in northern Nigeria, particularly in Kaduna, has, particularly in Kaduna, I should say, because Kano doesn't have a large Christian population, is that in Kaduna, politics from the 1980s started to take a very a religious point of view. I like to tell uh, those of you that are on this platform that I was alive. I was already a an, a, a student at secondary school when Muhammad Ugumi was saying in 1992, to be precise that they cannot afford to have a Christian as the governor of Kaduna State. Now, uh, that is Al-Haji Muhammad Gumi, he had done so well, I praise him for the things he did, but that statement was very inflammatory, and that statement set the ground for religious differences in Kaduna State, which has actually influenced what is happening today. It seems that uh, that is what is trying to propagate, unfortunately, Erufai is trying to be like a cosmopolitan person, someone who attended university in Nigeria and attended some courses in, in a university like Yale, which is not a Muslim university. How can he promote religious superiority in terms of in the 21st century? So these are some of the things. Erufai has a son who is in the UK studying. UK is not Muslim, but if Erufai would like the uni education in the UK, his daughter, who got, uh, unfortunately, who passed away, it was actually a, a student in the UK, Yasmin. Uh, so if you like what is happening in the world, you must like what the world is moving to. And the world is moving away from religious leanings in terms of creating identity to a humanitarian humanity, which I belong to. I do not believe in the faith of a person that I relate with, but I believe in what the person can tr contribute to the progress of humanity. Well, still on the politics of uh, of Kaduna State, uh, Henry. Sorry, we will come back to you in a minute. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Because I, I, uh, I got back later. There were some things I wanted to pull out to indicate clearly what Sadawna said before independence and what Tafawa Balewa said before independence, and that I was basically. The, sorry, I have read those. What I'm trying to avoid is for okay. us to do any form of. You know, when people listen to us, they think we are religious bigots. I am not a religious bigot. I'm just saying that so many things in the North, in the so-called uh, uni uh, unified North, had not actually been true. We, the Middle Beltans, who do not belong to the Muslim North, have never been taken along. We didn't know about that. We just went along without knowing what has happened. And I would always say that we, if our parents had known this, the, the civil war in 1967 to 1970 would not have taken place. Henry, back to you, please. Well, you know that, and and that's and that's very true. That yeah, the civil war would not have taken, would not have would taken not place. Have taken place. Yes. And then, as it was taking place, um, the civil war right now, I don't think we have um, a very very clear. Um, concrete reason because why we joined no 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 not not why we joined why okay. the war came about in the first place no i can okay. I, I have the privileged information my okay. master's degree focused on why the civil war happened okay now you see ojuku as a person yeah. that is i'm talking about uh uh, uh all his name chuku Emeka, you know is Ojuku was a very popular person with a degree from Cambridge. Yes. And the highest qualified northerner in yes. the government at that time was Yakubu Gawan, who was yes. a northern Christian with yes. a secondary school certificate. That's correct. Now, what happened was that at that time, Ojuku didn't want to recognize Gawan as the commandant in chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces. That's correct. Unfortunately, Yakubu Gawan was not known to be a Christian by many people in the East. Now, so the war came up like it was a Muslim North and a Christian East, which was okay. not the case. That's yeah, correct. It was actually a historical mistake. 
Um, we cannot in this generation be talking about Muslim-Christian divide. Rather, we should be talking about things that have not been done properly. And that is what I'm trying to focus about, that in, at the time, Yakubu Gawan, General Yaku, General Yakubu Gawan at that time, he was general, he was made general when he became the head of state. When yes. he became the head of state uh, in 1966, July, yes. after two weeks, after a week rather, when the coup took place, it was on the account that he was one of the most qualified northerners who had a secondary school or what we call a GCE certificate. Then he became the head of state and then the war happened. Sir, so I have it on good authority and I can refer you to, uh, there was a country by Chino Achebe that out of the 71,000 Nigerian army who fought the war, 70% and 98% of the people who fought in the civil war were from the middle belt. That is correct. And the re yes, the, the reason they fought the war was that they saw Yakubo Gawan, whom they knew, was from the plateau. Because the name Gawan is the name of an SM, SIM missionary who died in Nigeria. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how the connection with, uh, with, the, uh, with Gawan's father to have bear the name Gawan. And Gawan grew up in Zerzo, that is in Zaria, Wusasa Zaria to be precise. That's and he correct. spoke Hausa, yeah, he spoke yeah. Hausa like a native Hausa speaker. But yes. Gawan's father was actually a, worked with the mission. And Gawan yes. was, a, Ang, was an Anglican uh, member. Um, I, still, I still believe he must be an Anglican member. So before the people in the East will know that Gawan was not a Muslim, it was when he married his wife, Victoria, in, at, at an Anglican church in Lagos. Now, unfortunately, these are some of the ignorances we have had in this country. Now, our four, uh, maybe our pioneer leaders, we are trying to divide this country along Muslim Christian lines. And this is where we've ended up in 2020. And I do not believe that I should be treating a person uh, in Nigeria because he's a Muslim or, or maybe in relation with a person because he's a Muslim or a Christian. Rather, I should be relating with the person because what the person can, can offer, if the person doesn't have anything to offer, whether they be Christians, whether they be Muslims, I do not think they are going to get my support. It is rather a very unfortunate history that sometimes I am very troubled when I talk about them because they tend to pitch you as if you are one person who is supporting one ethnic group or maybe one uh, a religious group over the other. But things are not all right. Nigeria doesn't know peace. I was featured on Arewa TV, which is a Hausa TV, and the interview took place when I was a student in South Africa. And I clearly stated that when I was a child in Kaduna, Kao Kaduna to be precise, I didn't know that there was a, a significant difference between a Muslim and a Christian. But later on, we were hearing people preaching to say, do not vote a Christian. Do not make a Christian to be your leader. I think that is very unfortunate. We should take walk away from this and begin to vote for leaders on the basis of their competence and the programs they have for this country and the future of our country. Henry, back to you, please. And, uh, and, and, and definitely, I definitely agree with everything he said. Okay, the middle belt basically stood in the middle, as the name suggests. Okay, to hold the north to the south, to hold the north and to hold the south together, standing together. That's what the middle belt did. And so now the middle belt is paying for that with all this nonsense. Yes, okay. unfortunately, yes. Okay. We have served the North. That's we right. have served the North diligently. We have yes. supported the Northern People's Congress. We have supported the Civil War. We have supported yes. every success that the North has had. But when the North right. has attained its success, we produce the first medical doctors in Northern Nigeria. We for produce the first graduates in Northern Nigeria. Joseph right. Karkar that you talked about, is one of That's the correct. first graduates of university from northern Nigeria. The North was happy with Joseph Tarka at that time because he was a northerner in court. But the moment it was discovered later when there were other graduates, Joseph Tarka was no longer a northerner, but he was looked upon as a northern Christian, which is a very unfortunate history. We should not repeat itself in the 21st century. We must work against this kind of history of trying to put people or pitch people in the lines of religion. I have friends who are wonderful, academically sound, who are Muslims. If they are qualified for anything, I want them to be able to get it. 
I have friends who are academically sound, excellent, who are Christians. If there is anything that they are qualified for, I want them to get it on the basis of their competence. Why, why should we be talking about religious, ethnic, and other you know, affiliations in the 21st century when the world has actually moved away? Elumba, our friend Daniel, is in the UK. He is not in Nigeria. Why did he go there? Because he has something to offer. It is one of these things that he has to offer that we are on this uh, Zoom conference live and being watched by several people. So why would we not align with Elomba? I'm not aligning with Elomba, Daniel, because he's a Christian. I'm aligning with him because he has something to offer to the progress of Nigeria. We must get to that level. Or else we are going to continue to remain stagnant, thinking of ourselves from ethnic and religious backgrounds, which is very unfortunate, which is not trendy in the 21st century. All right. Let's take this question from Ariyo Atoye, please. Ariyo, can you unmute yourself? You've been raising your hand for a long time now. Are you, please? Are you? Yes, go ahead. Are you? Uh, uh, Philip, how are you? Philip, how are you? Yeah, man, 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 long time. How are you been? Yeah. Very well. I used to be an observer in uh, Sukapu in Abu's area when Philip was. Uh, no, I have, I have. We've always been together, my, my comrade. Well, let me say this. Let me say this. I am irrevocably committed to to the Southern Kaduna Court, I and know. I think I want to caution. I want to caution my brother Philip a bit. Is this look? You have nothing to lose by standing and fighting for what is the truth. There is yes, systemic sir. bigotry against mm -hmm. the people of Southern Kaduna. Yes, sir. You see, we must do something, and I'm happy with what. Uh, our brother, you know, Dan is doing on this TV program, you know, raising yeah, critical he, issues he, and allowing Nigerians to come yeah, across them. Yeah. May God continue to strengthen him and his platform. My, my, I think one thing, one thing we have not done on this Southern Cardinal issue, which is very painful to me, which I have, which I have said time without number is this. We are also not engaging this issue you know, in terms of the theoretical aspect of it constructively. We need to build a rich base of history. Philip has read a lot. He's somebody that has a lot of facts. Uh, Rufai came on a national TV to say that he has, uh, he has done more than any other governor for the people of Southern Kaduna. Yeah. Now, ordinarily, we should have been able to counter him with facts. What are the facts here? We need to put in place, you know, a chart to show um, what you call representation in, I mean, in Kaduna yeah. State, in terms of the yeah. Muslim yeah. North yeah. and the Christian South. From 1999, in terms of who is the governor, who is the deputy governor, who is always the minister and the speaker, we need to draw these charts at a glance and let Nigerians yes. see. If we don't see. do this and carefully explain how, how um, Erufa is decimating the people of Southern Kaduna politically. We may not be able mm -hmm. to count. And it is yes. very important. I, 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 I've told some guys to do it in Southern Kaduna, who I saw. And I think this responsibility should be on Philip. Now, ah. we, mm -hmm. yes, we need, to, we need to draw this chart. It doesn't take anything. I don't have all the facts. If, if, had it been, I have yes. all the facts. But I've, I been, have, I've been here all the years. I can give you... I, I might I might have the chat. I might. Yeah. So we, we need to have this chat to put it out in the social media space everywhere to be able to explain to Nigerians what Erufa is doing. What Erufa has come to do, he is the biggest disgrace ever known to the Nigerian political system in the sense that having been made, uh, brought to limelight by a Christian president, which is Obasanjo, by a Southern president, which is Obasanjo, and given relevant position that made him to rise to stardom. This guy has now used this position against Christians and also against people of Southern Kaduna to decimate a minority group in our nation. We should actually be able to I mean, con constructively fight him that is an ungrateful person. And also, probably he was a student of what Gumi said then, that a Southern Kaduna person must not be allowed to be governor. Yes. What Erufa has come to do, what Erufa has come to do well, is what probably has somehow been achieved in uh, uh, um, in some states where Christians are, are in the sizable majority, but they cannot be deputy governor. 
everybody wants to carefully, carefully. There was a time he said the Christians in Southern Carolina are up to 30% of the population. Which is, which is, the, fl which is a flat lie. It's a complete now, lie. He so, has no data so, to prove that. Yeah. In, he has no data. That, I, hope, yeah. I hope my brother Dan is missing. In addition to that, I said that it is also good for us to bring the figures out in terms of what the census said, to be able yeah. to counter by fact for fact. So yeah. these, are, these are the ways we'll be able to, apart from the fact that we don't have the power to be able to do certain things, but we must be able to bring some of this in help. Then we must also, look at what's going on in the United States of America. People are bold to say there is what caused systemic racism, whether you like it or not. Yeah. People are bold to say blacks deserve justice and people must fight for them. We, yes. While we are talking to them, we can no longer hide the fact that the, 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 the Christians in Southern Carolina, the minorities, are being decimated. And yes. there is what we call systemic bigotry against the people of Southern Carolina. We must yes. make all of this to both Nigerians and the international community. And we must be able to marshal out our facts for people yes. to have a connect with actually what is going on. And how we are systemically manipulated the Southern Cardinal for a Muslim to be deputy governor. All of these, we must put them out, including this issue of population that I've said. So, but if we don't do it, we'll continue to get. Then, lastly, there is something we must now say clearly because our, our demands must be very strategic and systematic. Yes. We are seeing that we must let Nigerians and including some of these assailants and attackers to know that. Look, the only reason why we have been unable to defend ourselves as people of Southern Kaduna is because the fair, the fair government of Nigeria and the government of Southern Kaduna have asked us to donate to them. Yes, uh, our power the power to defend ourselves. Yes, but absolutely. We are asking now that the government of Southern Kaduna and the government should return to, should allow us to defend ourselves. That if we defend mm -hmm. ourselves, no Jupiter, no attacker yes. can come to our soil to fight us. We will harm ourselves and we will defend ourselves and nobody will come to come and kill us. Because, look, it doesn't make any sense here. Just as we are about starting this, uh, about uh, this discussion, I also saw there was also an attack again, you know, in, 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 in this same Kajuru local government, in which one or, I mean, three persons were killed, some people were, what do you call it, abducted again. I just saw that. We are, we, we are tired. Look, what is going on is conspiracy. My, my brother earlier talked about Islamism. And look, Philip, we cannot run away from what Usman Danfodio started and some people now want to take to another level. We can't hide the fact that there is an attempt here to force the religion, uh, what do you call it, hegemony on the certain people of this country, if not all over the country. We've seen what this current government is doing all over Nigeria. We must not be, we must not be afraid to see what is the truth. The problem that is coming is like a tsunami. If we are unable to stop it, this dam will break and everybody will be consumed. And that is why we have to tell them the truth. If they don't want to hear, they must hear it. That look, yes. Islam is Islamization, some people are carrying it. We must also separate these people from the moderate Muslims. There are moderate Muslims who don't believe in this agenda. So that's the yes. way to be able to count that look, there are extremists who are propagating this. These are the extremists who are also talking about the, the criminal aspect of Sharia and Kaduna, I mean, Kano State, that are saying they're advocating that somebody should be killed and all sorts of things in contravention of Section 10 of the 1999 Constitution. We must come out strategically and say without look, fear or favor, without, without pandering to anybody's interest. These things are real. People are being killed here. It could be anybody. We must say it as it is without any fear of these people, without fear of contradiction. So uh, I don't want to take more of our time, but I think that this is a good platform for us to reconnect again and uh, advocate this. So uh, I believe that uh, this talk will continue, but please let us make certain constructive demands, not a knee-jerk reactions and approach to this. And look, we must also document some of these things, which I know some people have done, but we must not give up. And we must, the only way that actually Erufai can be exposed is what I've said by documenting how he has been able to disenfranchise a religious group in contravention of the federal character principle of Nigeria. Because the federal character principle of Nigeria talked about religion, talked about ethnicity, talked about tribe and language. So under that federal character principle, the issue of religion is very vital. So we must use that to why he went to Southern Kaduna to be able to bring a Muslim when a governor is already a Muslim and two ministers are Muslims. So these are some of the ways that we must be able to engage this man constructively and make, including some of the people who still think that there is anything good coming out of him from, from Kaduna State to see that the guy is actually 
a bigot from air to two, and it's unfit for public office. <laughs> we thank you very much. We, we thank you, um, um, Henry. Please let's uh, let's allow, allow Henry to speak uh, <laughs> from length on some of the issues that have been raised on this platform. Yes, th thank you, thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, both my brothers have spoken. Have spoken very clearly, and uh, I accept and I agree with all of them. Now, the first thing, let me start with the with the um, with the Erufai, Erufai, uh character. Um, not only do we need to uh, document what he has not done against what he has claimed to do, but let's also find a way to hold him accountable. And let him. Let him demonstrate to us, let him show, let him give an account of what he has done. The issue should not be just on us to now say, okay, let's go, let's go research and find out. We should also ask him to decide to, to actually itemize what he has done to indicate that. The claim about Christians being less than more, Christians put together, Christians put together are more in Karuna than Muslims. Christians put together. If you say Catholic, Anglican, whatever, whatever, yes, the Muslims are greater. But as far as Christians put together, I suppose Muslims put together, the Christians are more. There's no doubt about that. I live there, and I know. Okay, so, okay, go yeah. ahead. So, so Elufai needs to be held accountable, not just us. Yes, what you have said is right. If we can document all of those things, that's right, we should do that but we should also hold him accountable for what he is claiming so that he can justify. All right, thank you. You, you, you were about to say something about what um, the Sardwana said. Do you still recall it? I think because history has a bearing yes. on, what, on what happens today. Sardwana is a very, was a very influential figure. He shaped Nigerian history in a very large way. So what was that you were about to say what, that the Sadwana said before and after independence? Uh, he, I mean, he definitely indicated that, that the country Nigeria should be a reward to his father, Dan Fodio. Okay? His grandfather, and that, his that grandfather the, actually. Sorry? His grandfather. Okay, his grandfather. Because now I had something, because I got in late, I couldn't pull it up. But... Um, Daniel, on your this now, I'll send you a link that I, I did at YouTube in 20, in, uh, two years ago about that. And I, can't, I captured all of those in, in there because I followed all of this history, but right now I don't have it in front of me. And uh, you indicated that the guy um, is not available. So if we can come back to it later on when he's available, we can talk about all of those at, at the same time. But I will send you that link that I did at YouTube. It's up there. It captured everything from beginning to end. Because like, um, like uh, Yab, I'm also in, into, into those things, but I, I unfortunately don't have all the details here. Because like you were saying, Jay Starker was my uncle. He and I come from the same place. My father was also a police officer who was in, in, in uh, what do you call it, who was in, um, in, uh, in, 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 um, in wireless. So that's all of information was coming from there. I will have information about all of those things, but unfortunately don't have them all up here. We're talking about the war and all of these things. Yes, that was a problem between Gawan and Ujuku. And Gawan really pleaded. He begged Ujuku not for that for that to happen. But Ujuku wouldn't listen. But again, with the name Yakubu, those people didn't remember or didn't know that it was Jacob. Yakubu to them was Muslims. So basically, Ujuku fed them information that basically they regretted. A lot of them regret that today, that they have known. Okay, and right. uh, if yes. I may ask uh, this uh, question, it's a follow up question from my, uh, my previous question regarding the politics of middle belt vis-a-vis -vis the politics of the core northern nigeria now going forward we understand that middle belt is not just southern kaduna it moves into plateau state yes niger and a lot of states in the north central state that's correct in as much as nigeria has grouped them together as north central yes is it possible to bring the disparate ethnic groups in 
the Middle Belt Nigeria to have to share one political ideology and one future because my understanding is that that may be very 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 difficult to do what do you have to say on that okay who do you who do sorry we... can you allow me to answer that please okay all right okay go ahead yes, you, uh, daniel and all of us on this platform the ethnic groups that are referred to as the middle belt are actually more than 258 ethnic groups by 1962 census right Oh, uh, 1952 census, there were more than 238 uh, ethnic groups. And by my counting, there are nearly 300 ethnic groups, which is more than 50% of the total ethnic groups in Nigeria. Uh, the area that is middle belt today is ethnically uh, diversified. And uh, the idea of the middle belt, well, it is not very conversant to when it's very open to other people, but for those of us who have read, actually shows that it was the non-Muslims of the North. So in Borno state, you have middle belt, and you know Borno yes. cannot be in the middle of Nigeria. No. In Adama state, we have middle belt. And in Taraba yes. state, we have middle belt. Yes. In uh, Gombe state, we have the middle belt. In Bauchi, we have the middle belt. That's right. uh, all the plateau people, in, in, apart Nigeria. from Wase, they are yes. in the middle belt. If you go to Nasara, we have the middle belt. You yes. come to Kaduna from Kachia down to Kefi, we are middle yes. belt. If That's you go right. to Niger, the Nupe and all the other groups, they actually look That's at right. themselves as the middle belt. That's correct. So what is actually the issue is that there is a sustained plan of domination of these ethnic groups. These ethnic groups that are called the middle belt today were referred to by the colonial government in 1920s and 30s and the 40s up to the 50s and 60s as the pagan groups because these people had a language they had a culture other had a than government. the people in the north they had a language definitely other than the people in the north who were actually looked at as, as the Hausa and then the other Fulani who had come and were now beginning to base on the colonial era to say that there was a Hausa Fulani there, were, there has never been anything really theoretically and practically as House of Fulani in northern Nigeria. That is correct, they, yes. they, they, Yeah, the language Fulani is a Niger-Congo language, and the language Hausa is an Afrochetic language. And those of us who are linguists would say that any languages that have never had any connection in the past can never be said to be the same ethnic group. Uh, no. Ethnic groups. Most so that the Fulani came from Senegambia, and they were able to penetrate the area of the north and then were able to launch their jihad in 1800. So right. this idea of somebody trying to pretend to be House of Fulani is just another uh, coin, if you like, or maybe ploy to actually continue to make somebody who is in ignorance to, be, to, to live, to continue to think that there was, there was an ethnic group called House of Fulani. But as no. far as I'm concerned, no. linguistically, philosophically, ideologically, historically, before the year 1802, there was nothing in this country ever called House of Fulani. Mm. And after this, there wouldn't be anything if all Nigerians were to be diseducated to understand that it's just a political, you know, strategy to continue yeah. to subjugate. That's correct. Those of us who were known Fulani and Hausa in the North. Let now, me say it, this it, with all me... fairness. Yeah, let me, because our time will be running out, so let me... Uh, yeah, let me say this with all fairness, yes. that the Hausa people do not fight with the Hausa Christians, but they deny them every right that they are supposed to have. And let me say this, I, I am not afraid to be quoted anywhere, that the Hausa Christians are some of the most brilliant... Sorry. three examples and then I end. One of the most the first vice chancellor of yes. Abu Zaria mm -hmm. in 1962. Yes. Then his brother was Dr. Solomon. He was the physical physician of Sadona of Sokoto. Then James Audu, who actually introduced the NTA program called the Chance to Meet. He was the first 
uh, what would I call it now? PA or PA, uh, public relations officer yes. of the yes. Sardinia of Sokoto. Yes. And the first female principal, northern female principal in uh, in Nigeria, was is from the Isha Audus family, who actually is a Hausa Christian. So, mm. unfortunately, northern Nigeria is trying to play the politics of religion in the first century. What I'm trying to advise is that this cannot work. We should come back and start to talk about the politics of competence. So long as we don't talk about competence, we cannot move Nigeria forward. At least one of the evidences is, is there that any made, from what you have yeah. said now, it appears yeah. the, so the grouping or the address of Middle Belt, in other words, captures all the indigenous of northern Nigeria that are not who Muslim. are non Muslims, who right. are non Muslims, including yes. those in Sokoto. Okay, is there any effort made now? Because going forward, is there any effort to kind of unite these disparate ethnic groups? towards the next political dispensation to have to present a united front in order to protect their interests? The answer will be yes. What we are saying is that, you see, the, the issue with the religion is that in Northern Nigeria, they are very sensitive. So nobody really wants to go into religiosity. What we are saying is that Northern Nigeria has competent hands. If these competent hands happen to be Christians, they should be supported not because of our religious leanings. If today we were doing this kind of conversation versus the south of Nigeria or the east of Nigeria, I'm going to tell you that the north would have been proud to present me as a candidate to represent her. But the fact that I'm a Christian, I am limited. Unfortunately, why should I be limited in the area that the Lord has created that I come from? Today, the north of Nigeria is very proud of North culture. But there's a little plow proud of no culture in as much as the question of my identity as a Christian doesn't come into play. Why should that be an issue? Religion should be left to be a personal thing and then our regionalization should be the second thing which has to do with origin. Until we are able to get to this, the likes of Erufai will continue to play the uh, politics of religion, which was not what he played in 2015 when he was elected. He was elected on the platform that he was a guy with a, with a degree. He was a guy who, had, who, who was competent, who had been able to do certain things. Uh, some of the people who, pro, who, who promoted Erufai in 2015 are uh, clergymen. I know one of them, but because of sensitivity, I'm not going to mention all of them. But he's a the, is the Christian, well-known in Kaduna State, who promoted Erufai. In fact, he suggested that Erufai should stand in as a governor of this state. All right, Henry, please. Uh, we are now coming towards the end, Henry. Yes. Um, the unfortunate thing is that this blanket, this Muslim thing is a blanket that's thrown, that covers, that covers people, okay? Now, when you see these things here, all the names that are Christian names, like, like, like you indicated, Yakub and all of those things, people don't know that they are Christian names. So the blanket is thrown out there and you blindfold people. And then they think the Muslims are more in number, are more in everything, are better positioned. No. This, the Christians basically have just been suppressed for that way. For that, way. The, that area called Middle Belt, it would have been realized. But just before it was been realized, that was then shut down with the British, dangled that carrot of independent regions. When that carrot was dangled, um, Awolao, who was basically back in the middle belt then with AG in collaboration with UMBC, dropped it and went in, went down to become the, the, prior, the, the, the premier. And I think, I'm not, I just, I don't, I'm not exactly sure, Opara who was then went to the east and then Sardona to the north. Okay, that's how we lost this area today that has been refused to be recognized as a middle belt. That's how we lost it. Because when, when Sardona dropped, well, sorry, when uh, Awolawa dropped the support for Jay Staka, that's what, that, that was it. Because the AG and the UMBC pulled together to form an alliance to support each other. But when that carrot was dangled, Awolawa dropped and went on. And that's where we lost the middle belt. Okay. But the middle belt today is what held the country together. But what's yes. happening in the middle belt today is unfortunate. 
It is totally unfortunate. Okay? But now the rest of the country need to ride up because whatever happens to Middle Belt is heading towards the rest of the country. It's heading towards the rest of the country. Right now, like we're talking about, about protecting each other. Where are these armed? You see, I know the Fulanese. They used to walk around with sticks to protect the animals. Today, these wild things they brought from Somalia, from Mali, from Libya, from Chad, are in here. They know nothing but bloodshed. And those are the ones they brought in. So today, the, the individual Nigerian is not allowed to carry arms. But you have these animals carrying AK-47s. Where are they going to war for? That's a, that's, that's a war material. And what is their agenda? Okay, that's, that's, that's the whole thing, all right? But they're going to tell you. So why? Where are these weapons coming from? They are not coming from the south, the east, or the west. They are coming from the north. How do they get down to the middle belt? Who are the checkpoints? Who is controlling the checkpoints? They are all Muslims. They are all Muslims. Okay? So when, 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 when weapons come through, they are allowed to go down to the middle belt. Okay. Edrufai said what? He's paying them not to kill them. So if I pay somebody not to kill my family, and your families are out there, what am I saying? Go kill other people's family. Leave my alone. That's basically what I'm saying. Elder Fry was a police officer. He failed his oath. Thank okay? You. Now, when they're in there butchering people, okay, and the general, Butari cannot get rid of them. All right. Um, What's his role? Our time is running out now. Uh, yeah, just before uh, we, we call it a wrap on the show, I would like to ask... Um, being that we've seen the degree and the, the dangers of this, which you did mention that the fight will continue subsequently in uh, retaliation, what do you think is the best way to curb uh, that so that it wouldn't get to a point where um, my descendants will come back to say, these people killed my family. They claim yes. my village. I'm going back for retaliation. That's correct. What is the best advice or suggestion that you would give to curb this? Right now, the current administration is powerless. Buhari has, has got nothing whatsoever. It is a cabal that's controlling, that's running this whole show. Now, the only people that can rise up are the Nigerians, not the politicians. The politicians are all compromised. It is the Nigerians, like you and I, that will raise up as the conscience of the country and ask what is happening and get people to sit down and talk. Because right now, like I said, Buhari would leave at the end of his term. Okay? Someone else is going to come in. He's going to take his cabal with him. The next person might not be able to control the anger of these people who are lying in wait. Some of them, they're basically like wounded lions. Okay? We're playing on the field and your dad is standing. So therefore you can knock the hell out of me. But when your dad leaves, then what happens? That's the question. Because when he leaves, people are going to rise up and they're going to carry out the revenge. And then there will be revenge. And then there will be revenge. Right now, it's a sit down and have him. He is the commander in chief. He has the power. Right now, let me ask you a question. It was not long ago 
when Kanu showed up, right? And the uh, iPod. Now, the entire armed forces was shipped down there. Where are they today? To get rid of these people who are still killing people. Who are still killing people. And Buhari is calling them our compatriots. That's what needs to be done. Other than that, it's going to continue. There will be revenge against revenge. People will keep on fighting. All right. Um, Philip, your final word to the answer to the question uh, Lydia asked, please. What's the, are you still with us? Okay, what do you think is the solution? Yeah. I'll round up, please, in one minute so we can... Uh, what I believe we need to do is to get people in 2023 who believe in a one Nigeria and not in a, a, a hegemonous, hegemonous northern Nigeria. I do not think that such a thing exists again. Those who are trying to preach this uh to my mind bigots unfortunately even if they are educated even if they are widely traveled but they have decided to actually uh, employ bigotry as a weapon to further subjugate and divide nigerians i think we cannot my it's, it's evident it's not i think we do, we cannot make headway with this i've got muslim friends i've got christian friends some of my muslim friends maybe have been even more useful uh, you know, helpful to me in the past. So how do I just wake up one night and begin to look at somebody in a very categorized way as a Muslim, even when they hold different opinions? So what I believe is that we need to start to conscientize the people to say, next time we're voting people, let's vote them on the basis of what they can afford, they can uh, offer us, and not from where they come from or what they believe in. Because belief is not as important as the kind of progress we need, good roads, water, electricity, social amenities, and whatnot. Lydia? Thank you so much. Uh, that was really, really uh, straight to the point. We should come together as a nation to work with people that have things to offer the country and not being religious. Um, I really like to say thank you so much to Harry K. Ingerin for showing up and you really have opened our eyes and also to Philip Hayab, I thank you so much for being here all the while. Even though you were on the road, you did inconvenience yourself to hold this conversation. Thank you so much. And to everyone thank who's you. listening, who's watching, thank you so much. Remember, this is Elumba TV. You can